Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And today we have as our guest a gentleman by the name of Sean Strubb. And Mr. Strubb has written a memoir, and I don't know why it's not called an autobiography, but it's called a memoir. The title is Body Counts, a memoir of politics, sex, AIDS, and survival, published by Scribner. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you very much, Jim. Glad to be here. There's uh, uh, biographical notes on the materials they sent me floating in two different places, one on the on the jacket of the book itself and then on a sheet of paper. And I kind of like this one better. And If you don't like it, I'll read the other one. Uh, Sean Straub is an activist, writer, and executive director of the Cerro Project, which we'll get into later. And uh, he's a frequent speaker about HIV-AIDS, self-empowerment, and the intersections of sex, public health, and the law. He's a native of Iowa City. Also served there as an altar boy, I found out. And uh, he attended Georgetown and Columbia Universities. And that's a very honest statement because we find out in the book that you never got a degree from either one of those August institutions. You were busy doing other things. And he has his partner, Xavier Morales, and the two of them live in New York. And Milford, Pennsylvania. What is this with Milford, Pennsylvania? You can't stand the hustle and bustle of New York anymore? <laughs> Milford is a gorgeous small town about 75 miles from New York in the upper Delaware River Valley. And I bought a weekend place out there and just kind of became captivated by it and uh, and spend a, most of my time there, more time there than in New York. And that's a typical uh, New York situation. You get involved in a weekend uh, residence, and it becomes the big one after a while. Just, you don't want to hang out in New York City anymore. There is uh, uh, the the story, in, in a sense, uh, begins in your adolescence when you're beginning to accept and identify yourself as gay, and uh, I don't know why, but. It, you 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 got a, a job in Washington D.C. <laughs> I don't know exactly why you got that, but it's a marvelous job. You're running the elevator in the Senate Senate office building. No, in the U.S. Capitol. In the Capitol. On the Excuse Senate me. side. The on elevator. the Senate side, and and your passengers mostly were senators. Well, I had a senators only elevator, so only senators and members of Congress and members of the Supreme Court and the cabinet and their guests could ride on the elevator. I, I want you to know we've never had a person here with that kind of qualification. <laughs> never. Probably never have one again. <laughs> well, it was a great job for a teenage political junkie. Uh, yeah. It was like I, I described it as like having a contact high every day because you were around these members of the Senate and, you know, Senator Kennedy and Senator Humphrey and Senator Muskie and McGovern, all the sort of heroes of my youth. Uh, and I saw them every day in my elevator up close. And continue to uh, the, the the kind of in your blood politics that, that was a good was a good, good way to let it grow and and, and, and nurture itself. Uh, early on in the book, you uh, talk about what I call what was your state of mind while you were running the elevator. In my elevator, Helms was always distracted, Senator Helms, and uh, slightly formal, courtly, but not warm at that time. I could not have fathomed that my future would intersect with Helms and that our encounter would one day involve the use of an extra large condom. <laughs> now, I mean, here's this nice kid from Iowa running the senator's elevator and contemplating using a condom. Well, I think involving I, the senator. I think I say that I could not contemplate oh, you could that not. my future oh, okay. would have involved. Oh, right. <laughs> so uh, tell us what happened, you and the, and well, the senator. Senator Jesse Helms from North Carolina was one of the last unreconstructed uh, segregationists, you know, and yes. avowed, you know, racist, homophobe, sexist, and 
uh, in the epidemic, once the epidemic hit, he became the leading sort of enemy of doing the, the, the right things uh, in the U.S. Congress and had made himself a focus of a lot of the activist efforts. And in 1991, uh, with several friends from ACT UP, uh, we're launching a new organization called the Treatment Action Group, and we decided we wanted to do a spectacular action, a very media-friendly action that would bring a lot of attention to what we were doing. And uh, <laughs> friendly, friendly is hardly the word for it. And and, um, uh, and poke a little fun at Senator Helms. Yes, we we yeah. often used humor effectively to, and so we had a gigantic condom made. Uh, we we actually worked with some Greenpeace activists to figure out the measurements for the size of Helms's house. We were cruising by the house at odd hours and taking pictures, and we then had specs made for this gigantic condom that was made out of parachute material. Oh. Uh, and actually, now we can reveal that uh, David Geffen actually came up with most of the money to pay for fabricating it. And uh, and we uh, one morning uh, pulled up in front of his house in a big U-Haul you know, box truck and jumped out of the back of it with blowers and generators and guy wires. And we had practiced on a house up in Woodstock and practiced. Ta- well, timed each of us because we knew we had only a very little amount of time right. before the police arrived. Mm-hmm. And Peter Staley, whose uh, brainchild this was, and I were the fastest on the ladders and going up on top of the roof. So we were went up on top of the roof and others were inflating the condom with the generators and the blowers. And it was almost fully tumescent when the police arrived. <laughs> well, I, I think that's wonderful, and, and I think we're going to stop with you on the roof and, and the device fully tumescent, and when we come back, we'll, we'll talk about other aspects of your life. Okay. Stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. We're going to begin this segment with a correction. The author's name is Stroop. That is to say, it is Sean Stroop. He has written a book called Body Counts, a memoir of politics, sex, AIDS, and survival. Published by our friends at uh, Scribner. And uh, someone you all might have heard uh, has something very nice to say about the book, One Glorious Steinem. Read Body Counts by Sean Stroop and hear one American's story of growing up with an instinct for justice, then finding oneself in an epidemic whose tragedy is multiplied by bias. That's a very good description of the AIDS situation in this country. As a man who survived sexual abuse, rape, and an HIV diagnosis, uh, Strube embodies the shared interest of women and men who fight for human rights and against any government or person intruding on our bodies. By taking us with him on his journey from a conservative family in Iowa to the heart of a global movement for human rights, Sean Strube gives us ideas, strength, and heart in our own journey. And I'd like to go back uh, specifically to your journey and those first happy days in Washington. I was spending my days, you write, in constant motion, (laughs) going up and down, yet always arriving back where I started. My future was in a holding pattern as well, with an illusion of movement, masking the fact that I was on standby, waiting to see if I might shake the secret that stood in the way. On some days, I had a growing sense that would never happen. I desperately wanted someone or something to ring a bell three times and whisk me to where I wanted or needed to be. My real desire was to run for office, but... I was certain that was impossible as long as I was attracted to men. That fear caused me to withdraw from my parents and family back in Iowa as I took Washington elite from one floor to the next 
I feared being permanently grounded by my sexual orientation. And that's beautifully written, and I would sense there's a kind of universality to it. Many young men with that uh, orientation are holding back because of fear. I think so, and I think especially people interested in, at that time, interested in politics, because, you know, that that was an endeavor that exposure of one's uh, homosexuality was, uh, it just wasn't even a consideration that there could still be a career after that. And uh, at that time, I remember thinking how excited I was about my life, that everything in my life was great. I liked my apartment, I liked going to school, I had this job. I was fascinated with politics and I was right there in the very middle of it, except this one thing. And if I could just get rid of that one thing. Uh, And it was scary. Yeah. The way you write about it, you were very, very comfortable. And yet uh, you you were learning so much. And yet and and a terrible place to be. And I had never really been taught anything about my body. Any representation of homosexuality that I'd ever heard of was in horrific negative terms. Uh, I was very influenced by what Dr. David Rubin wrote in Everything You Always Wanted to Know Mm -hmm, About Sex mm -hmm. But Were Afraid to Ask, an enormous bestseller that seemed to me to be, you know, the expert, the the authority. And what he wrote about uh, gay people was awful and, you know, only described a a life of of loneliness and, and suicide and, you know, horrific things. So that was very difficult to find a path that, that um, you know, presented a future for myself. Finally, you came to the point that of, of acceptance uh, of uh, who you were, and, and you were even able to share with those closest to you uh, that, that secret. And you began to understand how it could be integrated into a, a, an otherwise normal life. You didn't put normal in quotes there, and you should have. <laughs> it had become a logistical obstacle for his career, and life, and ambitions. And so you began to a, a kind of double life, the page, or not the page, the elevator operator by day, and the gay bon vivant by night. <laughs> well, because as I started to to have sex and to meet a circle of friends and become part of a group, the examples I saw, the role models, were other gay men who were leading these very closeted lives but had a, a lively social life with each other. And so they were, you know, by day – uh, uh, presented themselves as heterosexual, and they might have a picture of you know their supposed girlfriend on their desk, or they would talk about their girlfriend was you know a flight attendant who traveled all the time, or, or whatever. Uh, and that, and they seemed to you know they had interesting careers and important jobs, and that at first seemed to be the model for me. But very quickly, you know, I told my parents I was gay in 1978 in the summer of 1978, mm-hmm. and a year later, I wrote them like a six or seven page letter explaining how I was, you know, precociously and I'm sure probably obnoxiously uh, devoting my life to, you know, to gay rights and sort of envisioned this future. Um, uh, And it was a a very, uh, I mean, I kind of find it remarkable reading it, you know, today that, that my mind around certain things was so formed then, but I quickly sort of evolved. And and, and you were so certain. And I was so certain. Yeah. And that that happens. <laughs> that happened. That happened, and and you were kind of on the, on the edge of of going into what what you call the deep closet, all the you know outside things talking about or showing that that you're quote normal, right. and 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 yet quote you're not. And that was very conscious. I mean, I really like saw two paths in my life. So I first came out, the examples, these closeted people. Then I started reading the gay press. I started getting interested in it from a political context. And I started to develop a political consciousness that then created a rift between me and this new set of friends I made who were closeted. And I started seeing, you know, hypocritical. Uh, I felt this obligation to this community and wanted to become more active and engaged politically. And you fulfilled that obligation in spades. <laughs> and you are fulfilling it now, this very day. And we're going to talk.
talk about some of that fulfillment when we reach it. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Body Counts, a memoir of politics, sex, AIDS, and survival. The author, Sean Stroop, is with us. His book has been published by Scribner's. Martin Duberman, the author of Stonewall, says in part, It's an absorbing read. It not only vividly recounts the personal odyssey of one man's struggle with AIDS, but places it with remarkable objectivity within the larger story of those years. Strobe is dispassionate, reliable, and a reliable guide whose directness and honesty create considerable impact. Anyone would profit from reading this book. I agree. Now, the last section, the last chapter of the book, uh, gets into something that I did not know existed. And I'm going to go to it uh, feeling very bad about not getting into so much other stuff that's in the book, your adventures with Tennessee Williams, for example. Uh, You're uh, having uh, to do with ACT UP and finding that a very good organization, one that satisfied you and what you thought ought to be done in the situation of age in this country. But there's a chapter which is the title, HIV is Not a Crime. And what it addresses is the fact that in this country now, people are making HIV a crime. It's the criminal, the criminality of HIV. Is that what we call it? The criminality of AIDS? HIV criminalization is the okay. phrase we use. Uh, you know, in the early years of the epidemic, there was an effort to quarantine people with AIDS. California, yes. there was an initiative that was ahead in the polls at one point. Fortunately, it was defeated. Uh, and then there was an effort to have mandatory testing and prohibit us from various professions and all sorts of you know coercive kinds of measures. And uh, where that kind of uh, uh, bias and fear and ignorance sort of ended up was in creating HIV-specific criminal statutes and using one's HIV status inappropriately in criminal prosecutions. So uh, people get charged with a crime, but because they have HIV, the crime is much more serious. So Willie Campbell is serving 35 years in Texas for spitting at a police officer. Spitting's not very polite behavior. 35 years for behavior that can't even transmit HIV is, you know, is, is absurd. And then the states have passed HIV-specific laws creating this viral underclass, laws that only apply to people with HIV. Um, and many of those result in prosecutions for people who don't who cannot prove they disclose their HIV status before they had sex with someone independent of whether there's any risk there rarely is HIV transmission in these cases people can do all the right things use a condom have an undetectable viral load uh, and still find themselves getting sentenced to decades in prison this not only imposes a horrific injustice on people with HIV but it is terrible public health policy because it discourages people from getting tested. You can't be prosecuted if you don't know your HIV status. Most new HIV infections come from people who don't know they have it, not from the people who've been tested and know they have it. Uh, So this phenomenon has been growing, particularly since combination therapy came out and the public perception of people with HIV changed from earlier in the epidemic, when it was expected we were all going to die, often horrific deaths, to... Once it started to seep in that we were living longer, the public health system and the criminal justice system increasingly came to view people with HIV through the prism of that extended survival and that extended opportunity or potential to infect others. So we began being defined as uh, viral vectors, inherently dangerous, a population to be sought out, tracked down, tested, tagged, reported, regulated, controlled, and increasingly uh, criminalized. 
Uh, to me, this is the most extreme manifestation of stigma when the government creates a different law for a different part of the population based on immutable characteristics. Uh, we don't create similar laws for people with other sexually transmitted diseases. More women in the U.S. died of cervical cancer last year from HPV, human papillomavirus, mm -hmm. than died of AIDS from HIV. But we don't have similar prosecutions around HPV or similar laws. I think this is a major contributor to stigma, uh, which is the obstacle to addressing uh, the epidemic, to getting people tested and accessing care. Much like uh, other things that have occurred in your in your life, you just don't talk about them. You respond with trying to do something. And in this case, you began something called the Cerro Project. What is that? The Cerro Project is a network of people with HIV and their allies fighting for freedom from stigma and injustice, particularly uh, this criminalization phenomenon. So we organize people with HIV and allies to work at a grassroots level. These are state-by-state -state laws to begin what will be a very long process to, uh, to change these laws and educate uh, uh, the criminal justice system about the real uh, routes, risks, and consequences of HIV transmission. And is there a way that people can support this effort? You bet. Um, first of all, there's a very short video at our website, seroproject.com, an interview with uh, three people who have been criminalized um, and what they went through. And, of course, there's an opportunity to donate on that page and as well as information to share with others, seroproject.com. Use that website. Go to it. And you can join in the work of a very remarkable man. He is Sean Strew. He is the author of Body Counts, a memoir of politics, sex, AIDS, and survival. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.